Welcome to Lead Today with me, Kalina. Let's talk leadership. Hello and welcome back. It feels funny to be doing an episode without talking about my book. <laughs> we just went through a series of 22 episodes that outline every single chapter, why I wrote it, why it's important, that particular quality like patience or purpose, responsibility or resourcefulness. So we went through that journey. If you haven't listened to that series, I highly recommend it. Um, and I recommend you buy my book, Memorable Lessons to Leave a Legacy. It'll it'll change your life. It'll deal with that voice inside your head that says, I can't, and and set you up to answer some some tough questions for yourself so that you're heading in a direction that feels really meaningful. So I hope you check it out. <laughs> had to had to mention it after 22 episodes of really going into the depths of why each chapter exists and what the concept means to me and why that word, why that, why this order, why why did I do this? <laughs> why did I write this book? So hopefully you enjoy that series and gain a lot from it. So as I alluded to in the last episode, I'd love to get into internal family systems. And weirdly enough, I thought that I had an episode on this already. And I thought I was maybe being redundant because I brought it up in the last episode of the series on the chapter about patience. Um, but I don't. I think there might be an episode. Um, it might be about confidence or authenticity, perhaps, where I reference it. But I don't have an episode solely on this. So let's let's get into it a bit of an intro into internal family systems and well let's just start by saying i'm not a therapist this is my interpretation you know as with all the other episodes i have some on um you know the intro to german new medicine or ayurvedic medicine you know i go into things and experiences that i've had i'm not a doctor i'm not a psychologist i'm not a psychotherapist this is not an area where I have any credentialing. This is what I found works for me as a certified coach through the International Coach Federation. Um, you know, this is what I'm using in tandem with coaching questions with my clients. They're concepts that I've found are really useful. So not here to, to diagnose anyone or tell anyone what to do. This is my experience with things. I like to just put that disclaimer because you do what you're going to do with your life I'm just sharing with you what I've found, what works for me, what, what's working with my clients. Um, you decide if it works for you, if it fits your life and what you need. So the system works really interestingly um, because the way it tackles the different parts of our minds. And it's um, it was created by Dr. Richard Schwartz. He can explain it probably better than me. So if you want to get it straight from the creator himself, um, I will link to his website where he explains, you know, what internal family systems are, what the paradigm is meant to be. Um, and their mission is to bring more self-leadership to the world. So maybe it would be nice to have him on the show. Maybe I'll, <laughs> maybe I'll work to do that because he's just, I think his work is brilliant. And that's exactly what I'm hoping to do with this podcast, right? The aim is to bring more self-leadership to the world because being a leader, so many people think, oh, it's how I influence others. It's how I influence others. This podcast works on how you influence yourself. <laughs> what are you doing with yourself? Because people will be drawn to you and will follow you if you are handling yourself in an appropriate manner and they will be drawn to you. And if you're in a position of leadership, well, we all know that the authoritarian approach doesn't exactly work, whether it's with your kids or your team or even yourself. It doesn't work. It doesn't feel good. It's not motivating. You don't, compulsion doesn't cause you to want to follow it. You're doing it because you have to. That's just not a way to lead. And I think a lot of us, even if we're nice as leaders to our teams, to the people we manage, we're not actually that nice to ourselves. And we're pretty authoritarian when it comes to how we manage that internal voice. And so that's the aim of this podcast is to bring more self-leadership to the world. And that's exactly what the mission of the IFS Institute is. It's it's literally in tandem. And so that's why I think this system resonates with me. Let's bring more self-leadership to the world and let's talk about how you do it. Well, Schwartz's theory, which is interesting, is that we have multiple parts of our mind. And that's important because it's our core self 
allowing us to heal. We're supposed to become integrated and whole. If you know anything about Jungian analysts and Carl Jung, which I know very, I've scratched the surface. Um, I'll have to have my mom. There's another guest for us on the show. She is a Jungian analyst and knows a lot more and has millions, it feels like, if not at least hundreds of books about Jung's work and, and how that impacts. And so that is about being an integrated self to my understanding. Um, and this system says we have all these different parts and we can heal it so that we do become all of those parts of our brain. So let's say the courageous part, the anxious part, the responsible part, the fun loving, you know, playful part, the lazy part, the angry part, the sad part. We have all these parts and to become integrated in the self, Schwartz's approach is to take all these parts that are in your brain and bring them, integrate them into let's say a table discussion where you talk and in coaching we have um we have an exercise and well i write about it in the book as well because i include mentors it's called the mentors table and so a little bit different but instead of taking the parts of your mind and bringing them together you're taking different mentors that you either know or maybe watch from afar and you're kind of sitting them at seats on a table in your mind you know visualizing okay if i had oprah and uh obama and donald trump like you can even use anti like you can use anybody okay what would they say how would Donald Trump approach this scenario? How would Obama approach this scenario? How would my mom approach this scenario? And you can play with mentors and or figures that you know in your mind and you can, well, see what they would do from your perspective, right? You can't actually call up Obama on the phone. Maybe you can, <laughs> uh, but, you know, and see what their perspective would be to get a different, different approach from your mind, using your creativity, right? To visualize, okay, what would this type of person do? So that's how the mentors table works. It's taking mentors or people in your life and mulling over a situation from their perspective to get some advice. So all in your brain, but you're kind of using different points of view, different archetypes that you have sort of have because Donald Trump will represent something to me and something different to you. Obama, your parents represent certain qualities and characteristics to you. And, and mine do for me. So it's all about how you see these characters. And similarly, so that's the mentor's table of coaching. Similarly with internal family systems, these are the parts of you. So they really are you. It's not just your idea about what Donald Trump thinks. It's, it's you. And it's the part of you that's anxious. It's the part of you that's feeling like an imposter. It's the part of you that feels scared. You know, these are all parts that we're trying to, to integrate. And I think it's so brilliant because essentially the way I use these skills. Okay. And, and this is, again, <laughs> this is scratching the surface of IFS. I'm not a trained, you know, I am an IFS trainer. So this is purely my take. Okay, but I use this with clients when they're feeling some of these things like anxious or they want confidence. I mean, those two are pretty much the biggest things I think people come to me about. My mind is kind of running away from me. I'm anxious. That's that. Those are the words people use, right? I'm anxious or, oh, I feel like an imposter. I want to be more confident. Those are kind of the two biggest things that people come to me for. So maybe I referenced this in the episode I did on confidence. I think that's what it is. Um, but so those are the two that people come to me for. I'm kind of scared, anxious, overwhelmed. I want confidence. And so they reckon with those things. And the way that we deal with anxiety, and by we, I mean me, <laughs> is I ask them to write what that part of themselves is saying down. Just or, or tell me if I'm in a one-on-one -on -one session with them, right? Tell me, what are all the things that this part of you seems to want you to do? What is it, what is it so anxious about? Like, what's the problem? Because the issue is when we turn away, this is a part of us. So you can't escape it necessarily. We want to, we use drugs, alcohol, distractions, procrastination, right? You, you'll just get your attention anywhere from this voice, but it's going to get louder and louder and louder until you just can't, Ignore it anymore because, hey, 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 right? It's like knocking on the door. Hey, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Listen, listen to me. Um, and it will get louder. And then if you don't listen, you know, the theory is that it goes um, beyond the repressed emotion into the tissues of the body. Um, and then, you know, disease, dis-ease begins. So we'll, we'll keep that for another day. But 
um, you are not listening. You're turning away from a message that your mind is trying to send you. Now, with something like PTSD, um, the idea has historically been that, okay, but you're, you're having a response based off of the past, based off of a traumatic event. Now your present moment, your brain is signaling to you that there's danger when in the present moment there actually isn't, quote unquote, right? And so you're, you are wrongly attributing the signals. The signals are, so there's something wrong with your signals. My question, because I have worked with individuals with PTSD, and what I think is interesting is that if they're hypervigilant, let's say you have somebody that's um, a police officer or a past, um, like a vet from from military service, right? A veteran that has served in the Canadian Armed Forces, which is what I worked with. Um, and, you know, and then because of their hypervigilance in their job, now they come back, they're in, you know, a regular community with a coffee shop and they go in and it's like, okay, I go into this coffee shop. I'm hypervigilant. I'm looking around. Is there a threat? Who's in here? I'm I'm checking, I'm checking. And that hypervigilance is exhausting because, well, who's in here and you're always you kind of can't relax your whole system is not relaxed because you have to pay attention pay attention um i think what people come to initially is well this is wrong this is annoying i need to shut it off i need to tell it to shut up i like we push away we resist from the uncomfortable parts of ourselves we resist it no 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 and we've already heard what happens when we do that. It gets louder and louder and louder. You get more and more and more anxious because you're not listening. So my invitation to you and what I've seen works, and it takes some some willingness and courage, a bit of bravery to do, um, but is to really sit down and imagine again, maybe you're at a table, right? And you've got this part of you. And then there's the kind of core self the person that's talking right now, and I can look at the anxious part, right? I can say, hey, tell me what's up. And then I can let that part of me speak. Oh, I'm really nervous. We have a lot to do. There are all these things that need to happen. Okay, what are the things? And so not only are you engaging in dialogue, which will get that person to calm down. uh, And as a sidebar, it's interesting, right? You're doing this in your mind with parts of you, this translates to the real world because if somebody is aggravated and you come at them or you ignore them or you come at them in a hostile sense or an authoritarian sense, well, they're not going to respond to you favorably. And that's where it's interesting. The way you treat yourself, as I said at the beginning of the episode, is in direct relation to how you treat others. Because if you're treating yourself that way, if that's how you cope with anxious thinking and you shut it down or you you block it out, you're harsh with it, you tell it no, Well, then how are you probably dealing with other people under pressure? You're probably reverting to that approach too. So when people, oh, I just want to be a better leader. It's like, well, let's, let's take a look at you because it's, it's about you. It's not about the people you're leading. It's not about the relationships you have. It's how you're approaching the relationships that you have always. And that's a core tenant of coaching as well, which is, okay, what's in your control? What's in your control is what you think about. Maybe not the thoughts come in, right? You might not have control over the thoughts that are coming in, but you certainly have control to direct them. You're the air traffic controller. These thoughts are coming in. You can choose which ones to focus on at any given point in time, and then you can direct them to the correct zone, right? Okay, wait, uh, I need to get groceries. Oh, that's not a thought that I need to be having right now as I'm doing this podcast. Okay, let me write it down. I'll deal with it later. So I've dealt with the part of me that wants to get things done, right? But I'm also staying present with you. I'm not ignoring anything. I'm getting it out of my head, but I'm still here with you. So I'm directing. I can direct thoughts as they come up, right? Oh, does my dog need anything? Okay, let me check on him after I'm done recording this. You know, so we attend to this. We do this all unconsciously. The idea is sort of bringing this into the conscious light, right? Bringing it into you actually thinking, oh yeah, I do direct my thoughts. And then well, what actions are you taking? So if your thoughts are anxious and, oh, I'm not confident. Oh, I don't know what to do. That's if you're looping in those thoughts. Well, then sure, you're not taking action. I don't know what to do. You don't do anything. You don't do anything. I don't, I'm not confident. I don't know what to do. You don't do anything. I'm not confident. And you keep in this loop, right? So with coaching, we are working on how you're talking to yourself and working on what you're doing. And it's always, what's the very next step? What's one thing that you can do? Just one. The amount of times I've, you know, it's like people are, oh, I have this big project. I want to start this business. I need to do this. I need to do this. It's like, 
Great. Write down all those things that you have on your list so that the anxious part of you feels heard, feels taken care of. All right, you're 100 things to do. Okay. And most of the time when people start writing the things, those 100 things that they need to do, the urgent pressing things that are really kind of on the top of their mind, less than 20, less than 10. Usually it's a couple, it's five or six things that are like, oh man, I should really, you know, do my taxes, pay these bills, take the dog for a walk, uh, the laundry is holding and like I need a date night with my husband. So it's, you know, there are a couple of things that really feel like they need to attend to, maybe five to 10. And then there are another 10 that are just sort of, oh, I should do these things. And they're kind of just creating a bit of turmoil under the surface there that like, oh, but there's more to do. Okay. And then once they have those 20 things, maybe 25, maybe there are actually 100. Okay. But once you have them out, well, then you can sort them and categorize them in the same way that you're doing with your thoughts, you can do with your tasks. And then it's like, well, but okay, so now I have these hundred things to do. And now I see it on a page. Whoa, (laughs) that's really overwhelming. How do you want me to act right now? We've sorted the thoughts. How should I possibly act on this? Pick one. Pick the most, if you want to, if you want a matrix for decision-making, right? Urgent and important. Okay. Which ones are urgent and important? You, I categorize them. Important, non-urgent. Urgent, not important. So I don't know, take my dog for a walk. Like it's urgent. He needs to go every day, right? At certain times or at least once a day, let's say it's relatively important, but it's not like life or death. If right now I do this. But so, and then not important, not urgent. And so maybe out of those 100 tasks, 20 of them are just not important, not urgent. When I get to them, maybe I will cross some out. Maybe I can delegate them, but I don't really need to do them. So you're you're just categorizing and that's one way to categorize. So now, okay, urgent, important. Pick one, one. That's what you do. You do it until it's done. <laughs> if it takes you two hours or 10 days, do it until it's done. Then pick the next one. Like that's how you deal with overwhelm, right? Overwhelm is switching from one item to the next item and none of them are getting done. And the mountain is so big and, oh, and you work yourself up into this frenzy. So now we're working you down into the details, into the specifics, and then into one pointedness, because that really helps a a one pointed mind. Okay. What's the one thing you need to get done right now? What? Okay. You're in a meeting, be in the meeting. Okay, are you not really in the meeting? Then do you have to be there? Why are you in a meeting if you're doing other things during the meeting? You shouldn't be in that meeting. So if you don't need to be in the meeting, do something about that. Don't show up. Why are you you here (laughs) if you're not here? Um, And I talk about being present in the chapter on patience. So you can go there if you want to hear more about that. But let's, let's stick with internal family systems. So, okay, so now you've reckoned with your thoughts. You're doing the very next thing. I mean... In reality, that fixes a lot of people's issues, but maybe it's like, no, no, I'm scared. (laughs) Okay. So the anxious part of you is now calmed down because you have all the things kind of out in the open. Here are all the things that are bothering me. They're out there on a paper. Okay. Oh, that means I have to talk to my, talk to my friend because we have a, a difficult relationship that that's what would fix, you know, oh, angry with Joan. It's like, okay, so now I've got to fix that. Oh, that's uncomfortable. I don't like that. (laughs) I don't want to do that one. And and so then the action part, you don't want to do that. So then it stays on the list, but then your anxious part of you is saying, no, 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 you need to do that. It's important. It's important. Mm, That's uncomfortable. I don't want to do that. And so the anxious part of you needs to talk to, let's say the scared part of you needs to be a conversation. Maybe you talk to the scared part. Okay. What, what could go wrong here? Like, what are you, what are you scared about? Well, they could reject me. They could say, I don't want to fix this relationship. I don't want to do this with you. They might not even answer my text message. They could yell at me. Well, I'm at fault. So saying sorry is hard. I don't want to say sorry. Okay. You know, and so you kind of coax that part of you into well, okay, here's, here are all the things I'm scared of. And okay, which one of those fears really are, well, they're all valid, right? But which one of those fears am I willing to overcome? Like, okay, I hear them. Which one would you be willing to 
take on. Give it a try. Well, okay, I guess, you know, we could text and I can, that I can do. And then maybe you bring in the courageous or the brave part of yourself that says, yeah, you know what? We can do this. Like, okay, yeah, let's tackle this one thing. Like I'll, you know, I'll take the lead. I'll take the driver's seat here. And like, I'll, (laughs) I'll help you send the text, you know? And if the scared part of you is really, really debilitating, which I've, I've seen, right? It's like, nope, can't do it. Can't do that. You've got to be gentle with this part of you. It's scared. <laughs> I, you know, if you have a little child that's scared, I mean, you can pull it and okay, you're going swimming and pull it and you can throw it, you throw the child in the pool and see what happens. And you can do that. You can force yourself. But the scared part of you needs, needs care, needs attention, needs a gentle hand. And so, you know, the idea is, And you might not have received this, right? As a child, this might not come naturally to you. This could be really difficult. And hair, like I totally get that. You know, as a kid, it wasn't necessarily gentle all the time. It was like, figure it out, do it. Come on, like push, push, push. You know, I definitely grew up in that type of environment and it's useful in some ways because the courageous part of me is very pronounced. I can push through, I can... I can close the scared part of me and just push with the courageous part and go through to the finish line of something. That's one way and it works and that's, you can do that. But you're leaving the scared part of you behind. You're leaving the anxious part of you behind. You're leaving in the PTSD example, the diligent part of you behind in a sense and saying, oh, you're just a nuisance to me. And when you turn different parts of, like if you're turning away from different parts of yourself, my understanding and and what I've come to see is that either they get louder, louder until you have to listen, or they sort of start decaying and dying in a way, you know, they feel unseen. And it's almost like, then you're not integrated, because right, you've, you've said to all these negative, quote, unquote, traits, the anxious one, the scared one, the lazy one, you've said, You are so annoying to deal with. I don't like you. You're making my life hell. Get out of here, right? And you you exile them. And so in internal family systems, you have the exiled parts of you. Um, And when you've exiled a part of you, well, that doesn't feel nice. (laughs) I mean, just, just if you think about it as like a friend, right? If your friend tells you like, okay, you're exiled. I'm never speaking to you again. You would not be so happy about that and you do die off in a sense right and so well hopefully you can kind of bring that part of you back and say okay let me you know come back it's okay I want to hear what you have to say maybe hopefully you can get to that point maybe you can't maybe you really can't and it's like then maybe you want some support because if if you've turned away from that part and you've isolated it so much from your core self, right? That essence. Well, then you might want to talk with someone to bring that exiled back because if you exile somebody, there's pain, right? And, and it's vulnerable. It's definitely vulnerable if, you know, the the inadequate or I'm too much or there's shame associated or like real anger and rage like all of that is very vulnerable because it it makes you feel out of control it's destabilizing so those painful emotions that have been kind of tucked away right you've said no no I'm you know you're you're scared, you're annoying, right? Grief is another one when you lose someone or you feel that sense of grief over, um, I think dashed expectations. You can also feel a sense of grief. You know, something doesn't come through. All that's put in a box. You might want some help to get it out of the box. And then there are these other parts, right? That kind of jump in. So that part that says, just get it done, you know, come on, you have to finish it, do it. (laughs) Um, that's the manager, they're manager parts of yourself. And so those kinds of dialogues in your mind, those seats at the table, the overachiever, the pessimist, the planner, um, 
the people pleaser. Oh, I said that, didn't I? Did I? The caretaker, like a rescuer. Um, if you're very critical of yourself, which will obviously feed into perfectionism, like those ones are all sort of like, they're managing so that you feel stable. So you don't get hurt. So that the scared, you know, the scared, <laughs> full, filled with shame, angry, um, grief oriented part, like that's just out of the picture. These parts of you, they're going to take care of you. They're going to manage the situation. Right. And so their, their motto is never again. Like this is never going to happen again. I'm not going to let you know, myself feel shame. I'm going to keep myself safe. And so they have a role, right? And if that part of you is really, really strong, where um, you allow it to run the show because of your past hurt, okay, right? Maybe you have to have another conversation. So here we have this table of different managers and exiles, and the exiles are not even at the table because they're like hiding in <laughs> the metaphorical bedroom or, you know, attic of your mind. They're hiding. So you have to bring them out gently and, and invite them to the table, look them in the eye, maybe have a discussion with that part of you that's really, really angry or feels dependent or feels a lot of shame. If you can bring those to the forefront, if you can write about them, okay. But you're going to have to be willing to look at the situation that brought about them to be exiled from the table of your mind, right? Um, and so again, maybe you work with someone on that. Maybe that's not something you do alone. But if you're willing to confront it, it can be big, big, useful work. Why do I feel so much shame? Why do I feel, you know, like I'm too much for people or I'm not good enough? Like what, what's up? And maybe you can kind of write that out. Why do I keep accepting suboptimal treatment? It's probably an exiled situation. And then the manager is kind of trying to, trying to protect you from it. Right. And so it's the manager's keeping it all together. And the exile is well in the corner and just feels exposed and vulnerable, wants that care, wants the attention, right? Like the fearful part of you, the anxious part of you, it wants the attention. It wants it. But it's so demoralized in the corner that you're going to have to be nice to bring that part of your mind out. And that's why it's so interesting to think about it as a family, right? Or as a, a system, because you can bring this into your life as well. Because yes, you have these parts of your mind, the managers, the exiles, we've got one more to talk about today. You've got these parts of your mind, but you've got these people in your life too. You've got the people that the way they show up is like they have it all together, right? I definitely have that tendency. Okay, I'll keep it together. I'll make sure everything will good will be okay because I'm scared of relinquishing control. I want to control the outcome of the situation, right? But then there's the exile that's just kind of like a wilted flower that just, okay, like this is, I feel so exposed and so vulnerable and I'm just, I can't, I can't do this, right? I, I feel that you're, you're holding so many painful emotions, the exiled part of you that it's like, they just, they're just off on their own. There's no, I can't interact. I can't bear to face the core part of you. So it's a protection mechanism that that's, that part of you is hiding, Right. And the last part, they're the firefighters. And as we know about firefighters, right, um, they're very reactive. They have to, the bell, the siren, the alarm goes off in the fire station. Boom. They're there to fix the situation. Right. So the manager is sitting there day in, day out. Okay. Okay. Next step, next step, an emergency, the fire bell, the alarm goes off, the firefighters come into to play. Right. And they are ready. They are ready if there's pain coming from the exiled part. So if someone's pushing on your wound, the firefighter is there. And that's where we talk about the fight, flight, freeze. So the firefighter might try to actively put out the fire or they might flight. <laughs> so distract, right? They might have addictions or um, procrastination, fantasy, obsession about things. Um, it can go to a place of, uh, on the end of the spectrum, right? Like self-harm, suicidal ideation. Again, if you're there, um, definitely please reach out to someone. If you're there, you might need someone in your world to, to notice that about you. Um, you know, everybody always says, just call the suicide hotline. It's like, I, I get that that can be really tough. If you're there in a place of self-harm or suicidal ideas, it doesn't feel 
like you want to talk to anybody, um, you're probably not listening to this, but if you are, um, you know, just make it known before you take any action, if you can, to someone, say something to someone. And my hope is that not only is it on that person who's feeling those things, but maybe if we know a little bit more about this, we can actually see these behaviors in others and maybe help them. Because if you're in a place of suicide and self-harm, again, not a therapist, not prescribing anything here. Um, but what I've noticed is if if someone is in a place of self-harm, they need, they they might need someone to come in and and help and notice them. They might not come out and tell you, you need to notice them. And so what it, what's happening? Well, exactly what I'm talking about. The firefighter is in control. And if the firefighter continues to be in control, it's going down the road to potentially that place. And so notice these behaviors. Notice sleeping excessively, working excessively, excessive sex, diet completely changed recently out of whack, whether eating a lot or not eating at all. Are they eating? Like that's going to tell you something, right? Are they exercising excessively or have they cut out hobbies that they like? Playing video games or any sort of distraction, right? Distraction type of behavior, procrastination where they're not doing or being the way that they used to be. That's a sign. And normally people will make that felt over time. So some people, sure, something bad or difficult happens in their life. The firefighter takes over, which means either they fight, they flight, so they distract, or they freeze. And the freeze is a dissociation. So maybe they're still there. Like, maybe they're still kind of the manager. They seem like they're being the manager, but they're they're vacant. Like, you'll notice it. I've seen it in people. I've seen it in myself where I'm just going through the motions, but it's not my core self, my true essence. There's an essence about me. And anybody that knows me, you know me if you're listening to this, right? To some degree, like you're hearing, I mean, it's curious and creative and confident. And I'm, I have courage and compassion for the situation and I'm connecting with you and you can feel me with you. You can feel that I'm here right? Like my essence is here, not just my words. It's like my heart is coming through my words. I'm with you. And you can notice that about people. And so if somebody's with you, but they're not really with you, like their, their eyes seem vacant, their heart doesn't seem there. And yes, I'm an expressive, passionate, everything's written all over my face kind of person. But there are, you can notice that even with introverted individuals, um, and I even have a trouble with that of like introverted versus extroverted. It's like, it's a spectrum. There are days where I don't want to talk to people. There are days where I'm really chatty and want to engage. So it's a spectrum like everything else. Um, but somebody that's less outspoken, you can see if they are not bringing their essence to you in a conversation, you will notice, Hey, something's up. Something's a bit off, right? If you're present enough to notice it. Right. So people say, I didn't see the signs and I'm not blaming anyone for somebody, you know, taking their life or um, harming themselves at all. But the ways that we can support someone that might be in that situation, if they're not willing to reach out for help and they're not in that mental space is as a community to be looking out for, is this person, is this person distracting? Is this person not being their core self? Are they are they in a place of when all else fails? That's their motto. When all else fails, like it's the, it's the Hail Mary kind of like, well, this is too much. I can't take this. And so I'm going to sleep all the time or work too much. Or so they're completely distracting from the situation at hand, from the pain, right? Um, because their job is to repress those exiles. The exiles are coming out, right? Ooh, this could be vulnerable because I want to feel cared for. I feel shame. I feel, I feel not good enough. I feel too much. There's grief. There's, Oh, this is vulnerable. The firefighter like blasts the hose at them to put them back in the, in the attic, right? No, no, not today. You are not getting out of here, <laughs> right? Like we're not dealing with that. And so we're going to play games or eat too much or exercise all the time, or just focus on work or, just, uh, you know, play video games or be in an obsession or fantasy. Like it's, it's dissociation and it's fantasy. 
It's, I don't want to be here and I'm not letting this pain out. I'm not letting that out. We are not going to be exposed and vulnerable. So the firefighter protects you from exposed and vulnerable, but that part of you that has pain, the part of you that's scared, the part of you that's anxious, we need to kind of do it in a way so the firefighter doesn't feel threatened because then they'll react. It's a reactive role. It's almost your senses. It's not, you don't really feel in control necessarily, right? It's sort of like these automatic responses where we'll defend again, fight, flight, freeze, I would say kind of fits into the firefighter role here. Um, and so if you think about these three core kind of elements of you, the firefighters, well, the managers, the firefighters, the exiles, and then in the middle, you've got your, your true essence. And that's what you're, you know, you're wanting to kind of have them all play together so that you can express your true self, your true essence of calm, clarity, communication, connection, confidence, courage, all those kind of C words. Um, you want that to be possible. The exiles want to be cared for. And if you can, again, work with someone or talk with them and give them a seat at the table, which will be potentially difficult work, but if you're willing to do that, well, then they won't be exiled anymore, right? You're holding a light to, you're you're turning the light on in the attic, you're opening the door, you're letting that stuff come to, to the light and letting them see the light of day in your mind, so to speak. Um, and so I, I love the way that this is represented. I love what it stands for. <laughs> I think um, in terms of, again, not only how you deal with yourself, but as my example went with people that potentially are you know, um, on the verge or are already self-harming or have suicidal ideation, um, noticing the signs as somebody that's in that person's world can make, I mean, a huge difference, right? So I think we've, we've gone down the rabbit hole a little bit. Um, there are different frameworks under each of these as well. So let's say, um, the exiles, we talk about our therapists will talk about, you know, your past self and how people can be kind of stuck in a certain age. That's kind of an exile where if something really hard happened when you were seven or four or 13, that part of you had pain, you know, and it's usually childhood to teenage years, which is interesting, right? Because other types of therapy will look at like childhood trauma and wounds and the repression. Um, but so those parts of you, well, they want to be nurtured and acknowledged and reassured. And so in the tool I gave you or the way that you talk yourself through, let's say the anxiety or the fear of acting, right? Those, those are coming from another place with coaching. Another big thing, right? Coaching, we don't really focus on the past. We look at where are you today and where do you want to go? And so I work with internal family systems in just my own way with the insights I've generated from researching it. I work with it by helping people to change, to, to, hear that voice that's happening now to hear it. Okay. What does it need? Reassure it, acknowledge it, and then be able to take some different actions because they have calmed that voice. Now, if you want to actually go back and say, okay, what happened? What, what are these painful feelings and memories? Maybe they're traumatic memories or experiences that have happened. What happened? Like, I want to really look at this. That's kind of where therapy goes into play, right? Cause coaching we're in the present moment, and future oriented, where are you? Where would you like to go? Let's take steps toward that. Therapists are, okay, what happened when you were seven? What happened when you were 14? They're dealing with the exiles, okay? So I don't really deal with the exiles in, in a way that let's say a Jungian analyst who deals with dreams, dreams are actually often bringing out what's in your conscious mind. Okay, so the exile part, holding disowned and painful feelings, the managers, there's a framework where there's the critic, the realist, and the dreamer. The managers are the inner critic and maybe the realist. The firefighter is the dreamer, right? Because you're kind of in fantasy land, maybe. Depends, right? Visioning is different from like dreamer of being in a fantasy and not being within reality. But I think... Um, on the manager front, you have the inner critic and the realist, maybe a bit of a workaholic, right? You're sort of, they're suppressing and containing the exiled parts. Um, and they're focused on the daily system, right? Keeping things in order. 
Um, so they're trying to keep, well, they're trying to keep you out of the extremes. Then the firefighter comes in when something really ha bad happens, like, oh, your ex pops back into the picture, it spends you, sends you in a tailspin, or your dad reaches out, or, um, you know, your marriage ends, like some kind of really intense event happens. And then the firefighter will use extreme measures to distract, dissociate, and numb you, right? So the exiles are like, hey, this is really triggering. And the firefighters, like I said, blast them into the back into the closet. So that's sort of what you're dealing with. And then, well, and then you've got the core self, right? So that adult part of you, I've told you, it's curious, compassionate, confident. Um, and well, the whole point, I suppose, is to be able to take the core part of yourself, that core self, and then allow it to create inner harmony amongst the parts, right? So that the system is not hijacked by one part or the other going into the driver's seat, but rather the self moderates those parts, which is what I've said, right? Which is when the anxious part of you comes and says, I have all these concerns. <laughs> the core self is sitting there saying, okay, let me hear out those concerns. Let's think like maybe a little bit kind of wild, wise elder sort of thing. It's the adult in you, right? The adult wise elder saying, okay, let me hear out the exiled part. Let me, let me hear out the manager and which is the, that inner critic. Let's, let's talk about this. And then you can create inner harmony to reduce the kind of battle that's going on in your mind so that you can allow that self leadership and wisdom to shine through because you're integrated. Those parts are integrated. If they're, if they're polarized, they're not integrated, right? So we're bringing the anxious, nervous, courageous, critic, um, the dissociated or fantasy, the person that just wants to watch Netflix all the time or play video games. Let's bring them all to the table and talk about this. And the core self is sort of like the moderator. And the more you can bring these parts of you to the table, so to speak, and have them work in harmony with each other, the idea is then you are one with the parts of you. And that's harmonious. When when things are working in line, there's harmony. And I'm doing this symbol if you're watching. And I it's funny, a lot of people do this, but it's it's this kind of alignment. We, when we bring left and right into the center, we're aligning. Um, and so you're aligning the anxious, fearful, the courageous, the just do it part of you, the critic, oh, this will never work. You're bringing all of those parts, sitting them at the table and saying, okay, what do you have to say? When you've heard them all out and they're all at least feeling heard, acknowledged, seen, then the core self, the part of you that's calm, collected, you know, wise, can say, okay, I have all the information at hand based on all of the worries, concerns, potential pitfalls, benefits, um, the fun of this, the challenge of this. Okay, got all the parts of myself in order. This is what we're going to do. And then as an aligned person, all the people are in the bus, <laughs> you can move forward with your life. And so when these parts of you are out of whack and they're pulling at each other, that's when you feel frazzled. That's when you lack maybe motivation, or you feel like you're going in the same circle perpetually. So I love the way that the system is represented. Hopefully I've done a good job of verbally explaining this. Um, I'll put the link to the site. There's some great images and things that really explain this in detail. So if this interests you, um, you can look at the site, you can do some research of your own, or you can absolutely work with somebody that is actually trained in this method, which I'm not. I'm simply explaining to you the 101 and how I have used little bits and pieces of this within my coaching. Because again, I'm going from today to tomorrow with people, getting clear on their vision and walking them toward that. Therapists are going to deal with the exiles and the past parts of you. But I'm working on creating that harmony today with the different parts of your mind so that you can move forward in your life. So that's where I sit. Um, I use it in sessions to create that inner harmony, to acknowledge and see maybe the repressed parts of the person and have them heard and then change the actions that they're taking to take into account those parts of themselves that feel like they are being exiled, right? Um, 
so that's where I'm working. And that's, that's how I bring this into my coaching practice. I hope it's been useful. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time and take good care until then.